Hello, listeners. Yamina here. Welcome to the Dr. GPCR podcast. Before we dive into this episode, we have a few announcements to make. First, we would like to thank our Dr. GPCR ecosystem partners for their support, namely Domain Therapeutics, GPCR Therapeutics, Design Pharmaceuticals, Montana Molecular, and Orion Biotechnology. What are you doing on May 19th? Mark your calendars as we will be hosting another free symposium, this time on GPCR activation and signaling. Our program includes talks from Oliver Hartley, Gaspar Pandi Sekeresh, Ilana Kotliar, Nicolas Gilles, Shivani Sajdev, Etienne Villard, Sura Shinoy, Paul Gasser, Stuart Mosley, and Kavya Krishna Kumar. We have an exciting program for you. We have also set aside two hours for poster presentations and networking on a platform called Hopin for the symposium. There's no limit on the number of posters we can accommodate, and everyone is welcome to present a poster at, a, at our upcoming events, including the one on May 19th. If you'd like to present a poster, go on our website and look up the event page. For more information about the, uh, the event and an updated schedule, you can go to the ecosystem. And the easiest way to get to it is to use the links in the footer and look for Dr. GPCR Symposium. You can join us live by marking your calendar and becoming a Dr. GPCR Ecosystem site member, which is free. To navigate the ecosystem, please use the direct links in the footer. And now let's dive into this episode. Hello, everyone. This is Yamina from Dr. GPCR, and today I have the pleasure of having with me Julia Gardner. Uh, Julia, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. I'm very excited to have you on, and I hope you don't mind me mentioning this, but welcome to the Dr. GPCR team as well. I'm also very excited to join the team. <laughs> We're very excited to have you on. I think you're the first team member who joins the the team at the moment where we're we've already had a podcast recording scheduled so this is the first you're 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 part of the first who, who go through this experience as a team member and the guests at the same time awesome happy to be the first <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we start at the beginning would you please introduce yourself Definitely. So my name is Julia Gardner. Um, I'm a current undergraduate student at Duke University. I'm a senior there. I study chemistry and Chinese. And I have been working in the Roger Gopal lab at Duke studying GPCRs for about three and a half years now. Thank you. That's so interesting when when you first when we first uh had contact and you mentioned that you're studying chemistry and Chinese. I have to ask before we go anywhere deeper. What what how does that combination come together? Definitely. I think that in many ways they could come off initially as seemingly disparate subjects with no overlap. Um, but in my experience, you know, studying Chinese and the type of analytical thought that goes into the study of a language is very important in science as well, um, because it's really enhanced my ability to communicate ideas, especially to varying audiences. And I started studying Chinese in eighth grade. Um, so it's now been almost 10 years since I've been taking the language. And I love the language. I think that it is so patterned based um, and the syntax is extremely logical. And then the fact that the character system is something that has developed over the last 4,000 years, it just has this immense history and beauty to it. And I find it to be a very mathematical language in many ways, which certainly helps with the study, especially as a second language and as someone with somewhat of a scientific kind of background and mind maybe makes it easier for me to understand. But it's certainly challenging, but I found it to be quite enjoyable. I think it's very interesting. And um, for those of you who don't necessarily know, I, I I speak and understand and can write and function in almost five languages. Oh. And these are very different from each other. But I think Chinese is, is a whole different level. Like it doesn't resemble anything that I'm used to hearing. And I'm always trying to figure out whenever I hear someone speak any language, I'm trying to figure out, okay, can we separate the words? And try and make sense. And Chinese is one of those categories. I'm like, no idea. Yes, the listening and speaking is certainly, to me, the hardest part, more so than the reading and writing, especially mm -hmm. because having grown up speaking English, 
a tonal language is challenging to master, both from a listening and speaking standpoint. But the more you use it, the easier it gets. Um, and so I try to use it as much as possible in kind of my everyday life outside of classes. Um, and, you know, I feel like the turn really happened when I started sometimes dreaming in Chinese. I feel like that's when you know you actually speak a language. And so luckily we've reached that part, but in order to kind of maintain it um, throughout the rest of my life, I think I'll need to continue using it frequently. Otherwise I'd imagine that the skills would slowly start to dissipate. So yeah. Yeah. I love, well, I think, I don't know if, how long we should spend <laughs> on the topic, but I love it. I, we were just having a conversation with two people last week at the GPCR's targeted drug discovery summit at the break. And the question was, what language do you dream in? And my answer was, I have no idea what language I dream in. But that's so interesting that you mentioned that you dream in Chinese or you had dreams. Oh, yes. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. But still, it's very interesting. Um, do you ever find yourself thinking in Chinese when it's when you're, you know, working or trying to learning something? Or is it a translation from English to Chinese? Sometimes I do think in Chinese, it depends on what it's in relation to. So for science and medicine, you know, I say that it's an entire different language in English as well as Chinese, because there are so many words that I don't even know in science and medicine in English. So usually in my scientific um, thinking, it's more so in English, but sometimes in just everyday conversational thought or just planning my own day. Sometimes I'll just find myself kind of planning it out in Chinese or thinking about how I could say that in Chinese. So yeah. super interesting. So how does the science fit in your everyday life? Did you always know that you were interested in science in particular? Was there any topic in particular that you preferred? Yes. So I've been interested in chemistry for quite a while. I came into Duke knowing that I wanted to pursue a chemistry major. I think that my real interest in science started around middle school, perhaps seventh grade or so. I remember the first time that we did a laboratory experiment in my seventh grade class. It was a lab on the temperature dependence of glow stick brightness. So looking back, it was fairly simple, but it was an interesting experiment. You took a glow stick, put it in cold water, room temperature, hot water, and then qualitatively assessed how bright the glow stick was. Um, and what I loved about it was not just carrying out the actual experiment and collecting the data, but also then starting to rationalize to yourself how this could be explained using the principles of chemistry that you understand, or the principles of science, really. And so it was really that kind of going a level beneath the surface process for me and trying to understand how data can be explained on a molecular or atomic level. And that's what really drew me to science and drew me to chemistry was the ability to really go to the smallest scale um, and be able to rationalize how those small scale interactions ultimately manifest in these outcomes that you can visualize or feel um, or measure quantitatively. So I think that was kind of the start of it, but I've been interested in science for quite a while. That's that's so amazing. And how did you get into studying GPCRs? We've spoken about chemistry, mm -hmm. about Chinese. Where do GPCRs fit in the, in the equation? Yes, so when I arrived at Duke, my first year as an undergrad, I knew that I was interested in science, knew that I was interested in medicine, and kind of spontaneously discovered at Duke that the MD-PhD career path existed. So knew then that I wanted to pursue both science and medicine. And so a logical kind of next step for me was to get involved in research because I didn't have any research experience coming into Duke. And so I was looking for research labs and initially thought that I may want to do something more in kind of fundamental chemistry, like organic synthesis or material science, um, but ended up joining the Roger Gopal lab at Duke, kind of just based on who was looking for a research assistant at the time and, you know, who answered my emails. Um, and absolutely loved um, the biological type of basis in science and really biochemistry. Um, and so I've stuck with the lab since joining in January of my first year, January 2020. And I had no idea what a GPCR was when I joined, but I now 
am so happy that I did. And I'm really lucky because I didn't know when I joined that Duke was such an epicenter for GPCR research. And so the opportunities that have come and being in a lab that is at a university that really does have a robust GPCR field um, have been immense. So that's amazing. And, uh, you know, you, you were you were mentioning how you ended up in, in Sudar's lab. And I'm, I kept thinking, my God, you're so young and already know what you want um, in that sense, because you mentioned you, you started your, your degree in 2020. Yes, my first year as an undergrad was 2019. So August okay. of 2019 is when I started at Duke. And then I'll graduate this May 2023. Amazing. This is really amazing. Um, once you got to know GPCR is a little bit better, once you got to know the techniques that are used in the lab and, um, you know, you felt comfortable working working in the lab, how did your, how did that time spent in the lab change your perspective on the field? Or did you think, okay, okay, this was such a great choice. I ended up in the right place and I really love what I'm doing. Was there a moment in the past three years where you told yourself, hmm, this is really cool? Many moments. Um, I think that when I started in the lab, um, I was working with a graduate student mentor and at the beginning, you know, needed to learn the bases of just scientific research. So basic cell culture and maintenance, um, as well as just the fundamental everyday sort of laboratory tasks. Um, and I remember even when I joined, you know, I thought that cell splitting was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. <laughs> it can be. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, 50 times later, it became less cool. But what really changed the, what really was the moment that changed for me was when I started to have to plan experiments for myself. Um, and so rather than just following a protocol and really learning the scientific bases behind the experiments that we do in the assays and how they, how they work, it was really that moment where I had to sit down and say, okay, what do I even want to look at or probe? And how can I do that experimentally? And I think that for me, that's when I started to develop a even greater appreciation of scientific research in general and how hard it is, as well as the GPCR field. Because in order to come up with those questions, I had to really start to dive into the literature in a way that I hadn't previously and learn about the history of the field and what's been done, what hasn't been done, and where the areas of knowledge are that we can potentially assess in our laboratory based on the tools that we have available. And so it's been one of the more challenging, but one of the more rewarding parts of the freedom and um, flexibility that I've had in the lab is to lead my own research and develop these experimental plans. It's so interesting um, that you're mentioning, you know, really doing the deep dive and asking, figuring out what the questions are and figuring out how you can, you mm -hmm. can answer those questions. And from a training perspective, you're way ahead of the curve. And anyone who has the opportunity to to work in a lab early on during their their education, because basically you, you'd spend a master's degree or even a PhD, depending on where you are and, and what the system looks like to learn how to develop these skills. Definitely. I think that especially with the research that we do in the Raja Gopa lab, which I'd be happy to talk about further, but we study GPCRs from a very mechanistic standpoint. And I think that especially in that context, it's important to also learn how to answer, how to ask and answer questions that get at what actually does happen rather than what you can make happen if you perturb the system enough. Mm -hmm. And so how can we manipulate elements of GPCR function in order to understand the mechanisms underlying the receptor's activity, but how can we do so in a way that actually does get at what is happening physiologically when these receptors function as opposed to in a system that we've concocted. And so that's been one of the challenging parts, but I think that that's really pushed me to answer so on like so-called correct questions to be asking rather than just any possible question because there's a million and one that you could be asking, but what are the several that will really potentially illuminate how these receptors are functioning physiologically? I think I think impact is is very important when considering the question. I mean, you also have to be passionate about about that question and 
Um, but still, you're you're way ahead of the curve. I'm trying to think back. I started working in the lab, I think, the first or the second year when I was an undergrad, and it was a summer internship, and I actually never left that lab. I ended up working there until I graduated, and I, I think I graduated April 30th, and then May 1st, I started my master's. People were like, are you crazy? I'm like, no, 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 I love this. I cannot take vacations. And then after, while I was finishing my master's, I've had already, I was already registered for the PhD program, hence the decade, the almost decade that I spent in the same lab. Yeah. But I don't, it took me a while to get to the point where I gained that independence, mm -hmm. not from a pipetting standpoint, but also from, from a scientific thinking standpoint. Exactly. And I Love think the that. sooner, please. No, it's just going to say that that's certainly the, to me, most challenging part is the underlying scientific thought and experimental design. Um, and I'm really fortunate that I have had the opportunities to do that even as an undergrad. And I'm lucky that Dr. Rajagopal as a mentor is so willing to let undergrads explore, let them make mistakes sometimes and fail, but then in accordance, we learn. Um, and I'm so appreciative for how much trust he's placed in me to be a researcher in his lab. So that's amazing. Yeah. And I, it's funny because we were, before we hit record, we were just mentioning that the previous rec episode that I recorded was with your, your colleague, Chloe, and she mentioned Dylan, who was in, in Sudar's lab as well. And I thought, you know, Dylan was, I, I, I loved the way he did his work the way he presented his data at the summit multiple times and i think that that clarity of those presentations really reflects not only on dylan but on everyone i spoke to in the lab so it's it's really seems like a really great environment to learn to make mistakes but at the same time learn the scientific methodology beyond the pipetting and the cell splitting Definitely. And a wonderful environment for undergraduates. I think that we now have somewhere near 11 undergrads working in the lab. I think each graduate student mentor has several who work with them. Um, and so it's a great environment from that perspective, because even now, like as an older undergraduate, I can help the younger undergraduates in the lab. And so we're lucky both from the graduate students and postdocs and PI, Dr. Roger Gopal, that we have, but also that as an undergrad, there's such an emphasis on training and education and mentorship. And that's important because you you learn many what they call soft skills at the same time. And exactly. everyone at every level gets to practice those skills mm -hmm. since you're you guys are paired. And I like the the pipeline type of a, like kind of a tree type mm -hmm. of organization where everyone can contribute, everyone has the space to learn and and give back as well exactly. to the newer newer lab members. Exactly. So the question that I ask everyone, do you have a favorite GPCR? So I may put a different spin on this question and answer it as a favorite GPCR effector, if that's okay. Because... That's okay. That works. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I think I think we've had favorite, uh, I think it was Andrew Tobin who had a favorite phosphorylation site. Okay. <laughs> Perfectly fine. And then there was someone else who had a very funky uh, answer to that. And I thought, how cool is that? I should have written it down um, <laughs> and, and twisted the uh, the question. But I think we're, I'm going to stick to the question, but you can answer whatever, uh, you know, makes sense to you. Amazing. So I think that my favorite GPCR signaling effector would be the GPCR kinases or GRKs. Um, and my, the reason partially why these are my favorite is because it is, to me, very mind-blowing that just seven GRKs are able to regulate the activity of over 800 GPCRs. And understanding the complexities and kind of simultaneously simple elegance of that system is just so fascinating. And for my research, which has primarily focused on biased GPCR signaling or the preferential activation of certain GPCR signaling pathways downstream of the receptor over others, the, GR the GRKs play such a vital role in that process because the phosphorylation of GPCRs is what really mediates the switch between G protein mediated signaling and then subsequent potential arrest mediated signaling. 
And so studying the GRKs in the context of biased signaling in particular is of great interest to me and is what most of my most recent project had focused on. Um, and so, yeah. Oh, cool. I think you're the first one who mentions GRKs. <laughs> I think that they're understudied and underappreciated in the field. So <laughs> I have to agree. <laughs> I have to agree. I deserve. <laughs> I, I'm thinking about GRKs and if, if I'm thinking about, you know, about presentations I've attended and attended and people are like, yeah, it's GRK phosphorylates and whatever. And then the rest have the most important part happens before or after that phosphorylation. And I think I'm guilty of that as well <laughs> because... <laughs> I never really stopped to think about GRKs. And now that you mention it, it makes a lot of sense, you know, having all these GPCRs and have all only seven uh, GRKs. Exactly. And they have, they're so heterogeneous in the putative phosphorylation sites on the C-tail or intracellular side of each receptor. Yet somehow these seven GRKs are able to recognize pretty much all GPCRs and regulate their activity and understanding the individual contributions of each GRK to the phosphorylation of certain sites or ultimately to receptor activity overall is what's most fascinating to me about the system because the GRKs rely upon different mechanisms of engagement with GPCRs. Yep. And also at many GPCRs, it's been shown that different GRKs phosphorylate different sites. But then there's, you know, the added element of expression of different GRKs in different tissues and the availability. There's competition between GRKs, whether it's cooperative or non-cooperative. Um, and so it, it's a challenging system to study because of all those factors that contribute to the just exp exponential growth in the complexity of the system. But I think that because it's complex and because it's so relevant to the regulation of GPCR function, they are important to study. So I've enjoyed studying them um, and would be happy to talk about any of the research that we've done in the lab thus far on GRKs. That's so cool. And, you know, I was, I was just thinking about it. I consider GP, each GPCR to have its own personality when it comes to working with them in the lab. Then I wonder if each GRK has their own personality as well. And since there's only seven of them and they have to decide, you know, which which receptor they would affect. I was and it's I think it's because it's late and I'm, I'm tired, but I was imagining like a board meeting of the seven GRKs deciding, OK, so which GPCR are you taking on this week? And let's stick to the to the planning. Um, Sorry, I'm just I'm just <laughs> exhausted. Um, Do you know or do is it known, and I don't know the answer to this, if there's any diseases that are linked to a deficiency or to, to some problems with GRK signaling? Certainly, there are several diseases. Um, GRK2 has been demonstrated recently to be potentially involved in several cardiovascular diseases. Um, and so GRK2 is one that we've focused a lot on in our lab because we do have a kind of push to understand GPCR functionality as it pertains to cardiovascular disease. Um, so that's one example, but there are several, several examples of either deficiency or improper functioning of GRKs or modulated expression levels that ultimately manifests in a pathophysiological state. Interesting. That makes me wonder, can, how can we target GRKs uh, from a, path, you know, from a drug development um, standpoint? It would be challenging because of the fact that if you target one GRK, it would potentially modify its interaction with all other GPCRs that could be functioning normally. Um, and so it would be a challenge, but I do think that as the field advances and as the probes to study GRKs, as well as their interactions with GPCRs advance, it would be possible, particularly if we're able to develop therapeutic avenues that enable selective modification of GRK activity in certain tissues or in certain conditions, such as, you know, in acidified tissues and make them pH dependent um, therapeutic targets. So, yeah. yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. And so if you can target it and have a cargo delivered at the right place at the right time, then it would make sense. Right. And you could thereby also imagine modifying the kinetics or temporal 
gPCR signaling because yeah. if you prevent certain aspects of GRK activity, then you could either extend the duration of G protein mediated signaling, you know, so long as the canonical understanding of gPCR signaling holds true, mm -hmm. um, and potentially prevent or halt internalization. So it would certainly be a interesting and exciting avenue to add in targeting of gPCR signaling effectors to the therapeutic development kind of approaches in addition to targeting of the receptors itself. I think that several advances are needed before we can fully get there, but I do think that it is a appealing avenue in GPCR therapeutic development. Yeah, that'd be cool. I think we, we there is, there is, there has been an incredible development in all the tools that we're using today mm -hmm. to, to, you know, acquire data on GPCR signaling, on the implication of GPCR function and pathophysiological disease. I mean, the quantity of data you can generate just by, you know, going from using columns to using 384 well plates, it's just ridiculously exponential. Now we need the computational side of it to back all the data and then to be able to mine that data. Um, I'm trying to, to, to uh, express myself this afternoon. <laughs> from a, I want to say from a tool perspective to study GRKs in this case, what do you think if we, you had a magic wand and you can come up with a new methodology or a new tool to better link GRK, a specific GRK to a pathophysiological function or to better understand how these work, what would that tool look like? I think that that tool would, at least at the start, take the form of some sort of phosphate sensor. Um, I think that one of the challenges right now with studying GRKs is that particularly with GRKs 5 and 6, these proteins are actually constitutively expressed on the plasma membrane. Mm -hmm. And so certain assays assessing, you know, quote unquote, GRK activity are based upon recruitment. Um, or movement of these proteins throughout the cell. And when they're bound to the membrane to begin with and potentially near, GR, near GPCRs, but only able to recognize activated GPCRs, it's quite challenging to differentiate activity from proximity. And so I think that expanding upon tools in mass spec and making more of a kinetic approach available with studying the phosphorylation of GPCRs, I think that having a phosphate biosensor would certainly enable us to more accurately pin down what is GRK activity versus mm -hmm. just its proximity to a receptor. And when are GRKs actually phosphorylating the receptor versus not? And, you know, Secondary to that, if you think about um, kinase inhibitors of GRKs, can then also, in theory, study the non-kinase effects of GRKs that could potentially be contributing to GRK to GPCR function. If you're able to then differentiate their abilities in phosphorylating the receptor versus some other function that they could be having in regulation. So I think that that would be useful because I think right now it's really hard without advanced ma mass spec tools to really assess precisely what GRKs are doing or whether they are doing anything at all. I think that makes a lot of sense, which makes me also wonder for, in the case of these two GRKs that you mentioned, would lipid composition of the membrane influence their function and or the GPCR or the interaction with the GPCR? And you're right, we look at interaction or recruitment, mm -hmm. but we don't... Yeah, it's difficult to to differentiate the the phosphorylation activity of the GRK or just the protein protein interaction, and can we separate those two potentially? Exactly, and to really interesting to me as well in the GPCR field in general is the idea of kinetic regulation of GPCR activity and how different therapeutics can potentially have different kinetic avenues as to the initiation of GPCR signaling events and how those can then propagate as to you know, differences in the ultimate signaling profile. Um, and so I think that with something like a biosensor that would enable assessment of GRK activity, we would have a better understanding of the kinetics of GPCR signaling events, which I think would be useful to understand 
those, you know, initial signaling events that then manifest in the downstream signaling consequences. Yeah. And I think also being able to to measure not only the kinetics, but also the signaling from a specific subcellular localization. Exactly. At, at the same time, that'd be really, I think, a really neat tool. Right. And you could, you know, if you had this phosphate sensor or ability to detect phosphorylation, you know, target it to certain cellular locations, which is similar to what we've done with the ERC biosensor that we use in our laboratory. We've targeted it to the cytosol, nucleus, endosomes, Golgi. Um, and so I think that it would enable so much specificity in our understanding of GPCR regulation, um, spatio-temporally, really. Um, and it, incorporating all of those components of receptor signaling, I think, helps illuminate so much more than just single time point assays at single locations that may not be indicative of the overall signaling profile. No, I agree, and I I, th I have I have this problem with with endpoint assay. I mean, they're great. Don't get me wrong. You need if there's no other tool, you can get an endpoint assay to work, and that you get the data. That's great. But if you can measure the signaling outcome in live cells over time. Mm -hmm. And then if you can put a spin on it and say, well, this is happening at the plasma membrane and no, this is happening in, endos in early endosomes or, or any other compartment, I think that's just a uh, GPCR heaven at that point. Exactly. So tell me a little bit more about the kind of projects that you've been working on in the lab, obviously, if you can. And I'm also curious as to... Did you design the projects or what does that did that process look like? Yes. So two of the earlier projects that I worked on in the lab were kind of in concordance with a group of students in the laboratory. So there were two other undergraduate students who were two years older than me that I worked very closely with um, at the beginning of my time in the lab before they graduated and then our graduate student mentor. And those first two projects, I think, have been discussed on the pod on the podcast previously by Dylan. So one was looking at the phosphorylation barcode hypothesis. So understanding how the patterns of GPCR phosphorylation affect the ultimate downstream signaling of this receptor, which we studied was CXCR3 in this case. And then the second project was focused really on location bias. So CXCR3 signaling from the plasma membrane versus endosomes. How does the signaling profile differ, especially between the three endogenous biased ligands of this receptor, which are CXCL9, 10, and 11? And so in kind of completing those two projects and submitting those for publication, I had the opportunity to think about, you know, what is the logical next question to ask? And that's why I landed on the GRKs, because I think that what really ties together the idea of the phosphorylation pattern of the receptor as well as the spatial regulation of receptor signaling was potentially the GRKs. And could we explain how GPCRs initiate distinct cellular responses from different locations based upon their interactions with GRKs? Do they differ depending on where the receptor is signaling from? Um, and so that led me to explore GRK activity. And so the first kind of experiment that I did that ultimately informed the rest of this project was looking at just GRK recruitment of GRKs 2, 3, 5, and 6. So those are the four ubiquitously expressed GRKs to CXCR3 at the plasma membrane. And this was using the three endogenous biased peptides, so CXCL9, 10, and 11 again, as well as two synthetic small molecule agonists. And when I performed this assay looking at recruitment to the receptor, and again, recruitment for GRKs 5 and 6 is hard to interpret because they're already at the membrane, but particularly for GRKs 2 and 3, when you look at the receptor, the kinetic profile shows an increase, a slight decrease, and then at later time points, another increase. And so it's kind of this biphasic seeming recruitment. But then if you use a bystander approach and look at GRK recruitment to the plasma membrane, if you tag you know, CD8 alpha or CAX or another membrane tag, um, the kinetic profile looks very different. The concentration response looks precisely similar. Um, but after that initial increase, the signal drops off kinetically. 
And so this led me to wonder whether this second increase on the receptor recruitment represented GRK engagement with GPCRs beyond the plasma membrane, potentially in endosomes. And so repeated the same assay, but this time looking at GRK recruitment to endosomes and was able to detect GRK recruitment to endosomes, which is an exciting finding in and of itself. But what was particularly exciting was the fact that the recruitment pattern was very different than that which was seen looking at the plasma membrane. And so this kind of suggests that perhaps one mechanism underlying location-biased GPCR signaling is the differential engagement of a receptor with different GRK isoforms, depending upon the location. And so secondarily to that, developed a number of GRK mutants that localize each GRK either to the plasma membrane or to endosomes, and was able to probe how manipulating the cellular localization of, G of GRKs ultimately affects GPCR signaling by looking at several outputs, such as you know, beta arrestin recruitment and activation of ERK downstream of the receptor. And so it was an exciting project because there's been some evidence in the past suggestive of GRK engagement with GPCRs beyond the plasma membrane, but I think that we show very strong evidence suggesting that GRKs can engage with GPCRs from endosomes and that they do so in a way that's different than how they engage at the plasma membrane. And so I think that we've opened up avenues for exploring how one GPCR bound to the same ligand can ultimately induce different cellular signaling depending on where in the cell this GPCR is signaling from. Love it. And I was trying to, um, I was wondering, so you've, you've used CXCR3 as your model system. I wonder if these patterns are conserved among other chemokine receptors and among other GPCRs, or does that change from GPCR to GPCR? Yes. So I actually did that experiment. It's figure six in our most recent manuscript, which will hopefully be published soon, but it's up on BioArchive. Um, but this is, we looked at, in addition to CXCR3, several other therapeutically relevant GPCRs. So the angiotensin 2 type 1 receptor, AT1R, V2R, the opioid receptor, um, ACKR3, which is another chemokine receptor, um, and the beta 2 adrenergic receptor. And it, precisely what you were saying holds true, which is that if you look at recruitment of each of the GRKs to these receptors at the plasma membrane, you know, one of the receptors recruits more of GRK2 than the other, but then if you look at endosomes, this pattern does not necessarily hold true. So it seems as though some GPCRs have a very strong ability to engage with certain GRKs at the plasma membrane, mm -hmm. but others have a strong ability to engage with the same GRK from endosomes. And so I think that Adding this study, looking at several other GPCRs was important because it demonstrates that, you know, this effect is potentially conserved beyond CXCR3, wherein GPCRs are able to engage with GRKs from endosomes. Well, and I'm going to push it one step further. I think uh, if I remember correctly, the receptors you just mentioned, they're all class A. What happens with other, you know, I'm thinking here class B receptors. I'm... I don't know if you've thought about it. And then I'm wondering, does it change anything? Right. We'd have to look into it. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm really, I'm just curious to see because class Bs are, there's a couple of them. They're all binding hormone peptides. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these are the GLPs and the PTH type receptors. And I wonder if their mechanism of, of signaling plus minus GRK and, and the localization might change. Is it a family A generalizable concept or can what does it look like in, in class Bs? It would certainly be interesting to look into. Um, and I think that it would expand our understanding potentially of how GRKs interact with beta rest and mediated signaling um, and as well as how GRKs play a role in the internalization profile of receptors because really class A and class B gets at arrestins and internalization. Um, and so 
it would certainly be interesting to look into. That's cool. Yeah, I'm I'm super interested uh, to to read the paper. I have to admit, I haven't seen it. I haven't looked looked up and my question was completely naive, but I'm glad that you guys did the, the experiments and that I can go to bioarchive and, and, and read the full study. Yeah, uh, let's see. It will be published soon. So I will let you know when it is, but I hope so. I really hope so. Um, I wanted us to a little bit shift gears um, mm -hmm. and talk a little bit more about your experience in academia versus your experience in industry. Now, um, we haven't cleared it with the industry company. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're going to bite our heads off as to mentioning where you spend the summer working, but if you can give us an, a highlight, the highlights of mm -hmm. the differences between working in academia versus working in industry and why were you motivated to kind of get that industry experience? Definitely. I think that I... It should be allowed to say that I worked at Sapterna this past summer. So the recently founded GPCR based therapeutic development company that Bob Lefkowitz at Duke and others um, founded. And so it was actually through my mentorship relationship with Dr. Lefkowitz that I ended up at Sapterna. They had just launched last January and had no intentions really of having any sort of summer internship program. But based on my work um, and some of the work that I've done at Duke and, you know, Dr. Lefkowitz's knowledge of that work, he asked the team in San Francisco if there'd be any way to get something going for this last summer. Um, and they put something into place and I was their first ever summer intern. And it was a wonderful experience. Um, I maybe will err on the side of not discussing too heavily the work that we did there, but um, I was working on the disease biology team. And so focusing on a specific receptor on the pipeline and trying to understand the pathology and the signaling that manifests in the pathology of a specific GPCR and of potential clinical indications. Mm -hmm. um, I think that part of the reason why I was motivated to explore industry a little bit was to understand how these very fundamental mechanistic findings of GPCRs that we, you know, propose in the Raja Gopal lab or in other academic settings, you know, how those are ultimately used to achieve new therapeutics to benefit patients. And so I think that it kind of expanded my understanding of the steps A through H of the process in drug development kind of through step Z um, as to how these findings are ultimately clinically useful, which is the goal of our research in academia in the Raja Gopal lab. And so it was just such an incredible experience from so many perspectives. The environment there is amazing. And the, you know, fact that it was just recently launched kind of meant that Everyone was excited to just figure out whatever we could about how to best, you know, form the direction of the company as well as how to explore scientifically. And so I remember this summer we were looking to, you know, get some new equipment. And so I went on several demos of some microscopes. And for one of the demos, um, we realized that actually of all people in the room, I probably had the most microscopy experience. And so <laughs> <laughs> it was really great to be at the very early stages of the company because it enabled me to have a really hands-on role in the science that I was doing, as well as in the, you know, infrastructure of the company. So that's awesome. Yeah. And I have, I have to say that uh, I know a couple of people at Subterna and uh, the second GPCR targeted drug discovery summit last mm -hmm. week. They were they were presenting. So Ryan presented, Yui Klein presented, and then Jeff as well presented. Three separate presentations. Two were more of a review mm -hmm. uh, about allosteric modulators. Um, everything is in the public domain, and mm -hmm. then and then Jeff's presentation was around one specific GPCR in the pipeline and how they went to discover a small molecule agonist mm -hmm. for that class B GPCR. And I think that was the highlight of the, I, that was my favorite talk throughout the conference because this has been a long time coming for, for the GPCR itself. And I was there, I was like, wow, you guys are amazing. I mean, it was just really a cool, 
Yes, I think that, you know, in addition to the technology and brains that they have at the company, I think that what's extremely valuable is the fact that each of the individual teams really work together. So the structural biology team, the disease biology team, and then the medicinal chemists and others, you know, it's how can the findings that each team illuminates, how can those enhance the work of each of the others? And so there's such a symbiotic relationship between all of them and everyone is really just working together for a common goal. Um, and each of the people within each of those teams is just so incredibly knowledgeable about the GPCR field as well as science in general. Um, and towards the end of when I was working there at the end of the summer um, is when we really started to explore some of the animal models and how we can test these drugs um, and see their effect. And so it was very exciting to really see from the start of the summer, the beginnings of structure-based drug design all the way up through potentially testing compounds in physiological states. So I think it's awesome. And I think um, it's, it's great that you had the opportunity to see it because I think it puts into perspective why people work in the lab and why are we trying to understand at that moment, seemingly very small things, but it's the accumulation of all those small discoveries that enable a better understanding of higher level events in the Thanks. cells, in the body, in organs and tissues and in animal models. And ultimately the goal is to improve human health. So I think it's a really, it's, it's, it's two sides of the same coin when I think about academia and industry. I'm glad you were able to see the whole the whole process, but I have to say I loved I loved the talk of actually all three, but mainly the data that they generated mm -hmm. recently that was shared at the at the meeting. It was a really cool meeting. Not to say that the other talks were not interesting, but this was the one where I was like, "Wow, this is really cool." Sometimes you go to these meetings and people don't reveal what the target is; they show you the data, but it's anonymized, and you're like, "Yeah, well." GPCR one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, but we don't know what it is exactly. So it's hard to get as excited when you don't know what receptor you're you're looking at. Yes. I'm hopeful for the sake of the company as well as, as the sake of the patients that the therapeutics could ultimately help, that they have nothing but success going forward. And I think that with the team that they have, um, who in addition to being brilliant scientists are just such wonderful people. Um, I think that they will be successful. So I, I think from, from, from what I've seen, I think the team is, is a really strong team, both from a drug discovery aspect, but also from a GPCR aspect. It's a, it's a GPCR company. I mean, you can't be more GPCR than that. Definitely. Exactly. Cool. So once you graduate, what is next for you? So next I will be starting my MD PhD. So that will be starting this summer slash fall, depending on where I do it. Um, and so, yeah, it's coming around the corner. Um, but I decided that I wanted to try to go straight through. So not taking any gap years as of now and mm -hmm. have applied and interviewed and hopefully over the next few weeks we'll know where I will be doing that. Well, yeah, I feel you finish one day and start the, the next degree the next day and then finish exactly. power through. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, long term would hope to utilize those two degrees in a career as a physician scientist. So pairing clinical medicine and seeing patients with basic science research, what precisely that looks like. Too young to really know that, um, but probably in some way, mix of academia, industry, um, mm -hmm. and she care. So that's awesome. Um, typically, I always have this question about advice for young scientists who want to contribute to the field. Uh, I'm gonna ask this question because this, you know, you're you're undergrad, you're going to to start an MD PhD degree, but you've been around the block from a lab perspective, mm -hmm. but also from you know, you spend the summer working working in industry. Any advice to share with your peers and junior scientists? Definitely, I'd say you know, especially for younger scientists, um, you know feel comfortable 
trusting in your abilities and not being told, you know, oh, like you're too young to do that. Um, because I think that if my experience has taught me anything, it's that you can be a fully functioning scientist as an undergraduate, despite the fact that, you know, you may not have the degrees yet or the years and years of experience. But that doesn't mean that if you don't do all of the work that's required to really understand what it is you're doing. So read the literature, talk with scientists in your field, listen to the presentations and talks, you know, engage with the research outside of just when you're in the lab and read about it or listen to talks from, um, you know, that are recorded. If you do all of those things and you show up in the lab every day and are excited to learn, then you can be a real scientist and not just like an undergraduate researcher who's following protocols. And you can do all the challenging tasks of designing your own experiments and figuring out what it is within the field that you want to explore. And so I think that you know, there are so many opportunities to do that so long as you, A, are in an environment that will support you in that. And so mentorship is very important in that regard. Um, and then also that you yourself take the initiative to do so, because that's something that you have to earn that right to really be a true scientist, especially as an undergraduate. But that doesn't mean that you cannot do it. And if you work for it, then the rewards are immense and the personal development and intellectual development will come without a doubt. I love it. And I think by choosing the right mentor, by choosing the right environment, you're surrounding yourself with people who are smarter than you are, which is great because that's the best place to learn. Um, and you shouldn't feel, I think, bad about asking questions and question no there's no such thing as a stupid or naive well naive maybe but not stupid question um if you if you're it's like you know you type a question into google and it kind of finishes your sentence that means that you're not the only person who's looking for that answer i think that's very very important and oh that was something i wanted to add to that but i think finding the right environment is really key there exactly and i think that you know you're almost in many ways kind of like an undifferentiated stem cell at the beginning of your <laughs> undergraduate career. And I, so I think that a certain amount of openness to whatever the science is that you're exploring, I think that in many ways you could become excited about it. And so I tried to approach undergrad with the mindset of you know, not trying to pigeonhole myself into a specific disease or specific type of science or laboratory that I wanted to get involved in, but rather just where was the mentorship and where was the passion and environment that I wanted to be in? And then, you know, I get excited about the science because if you love science, then whatever it is that you're doing, yeah. um, at least as an undergrad, you can very quickly develop that same passion and excitement. And so that's kind of another component of it is even if it's not initially the type of science that you thought that you wanted to do in the same way that I thought I wanted to do, do something more in organic synthesis, mm -hmm. Um, if you really commit to the field and are surrounded by people who are so passionate about what they do, it's contagious. And so I think yeah. that the passion will certainly come. And I think the GPCR field is a really great field to be in because the majority of people are very driven, very nice, very knowledgeable at the same time. It's a very, you know, open armed, accepting community. And uh, we're always happy to have more people work on GPCRs because there's just challenges left and right. Definitely. And there are so many types of GPCR research. So you could be doing something ranging from the most translational, clinically relevant type of research all the way down to the level of the very fundamental, you know, structural biology and really GPCR technology development um, and things like conformational dynamics have interested me so much recently. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, within the GPCR field, you have these opportunities to be exposed really across scientific fields. And that's additionally very exciting about the GPCR field. I think so too. Um, top three aha moment that shaped your trajectory. Well, I have to think about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's see. So there was one experiment that I remember very vividly doing right when I joined the lab. Um, and we were trying to look at the role of phosphorylation from an electrostatic standpoint in hindering G protein signaling, in addition to like the steric hindrance of beta arrestins. Mm -hmm. 
And I remember this experiment so vividly because it just simply didn't work. And I think that the reason why it didn't work was really rooted in how the experiment was designed. And that to me was the aha moment of, you know, you could be asking a decent question, but if the tools that you're using to answer it are not going to give you the answer that you're of the question that you're asking for, then the data is going to be confusing. And so that was kind of this moment where I realized that before you start doing your experiments, sit down and think about what is the best way to answer it. Um, second to that, I think that I've done a lot of confocal microscopy in the lab um, and I love it. I think that it's just a different type of science compared to some of the plate-based assays and more quantitative um, luminescence-based approaches that we take, you know, Western blotting, et cetera. Um, and I think that the first time that you are actually able to see a cell at 100x magnification, and especially when we look at cellular processes like internalization, and you can see an endosome light up um, and see different proteins localizing at an endosome at that just super high level of magnification. It almost like gave a face to the science that I was doing in the same way that like, if you know a person by reading their work, but then you meet the author, um, it like gives a face to it. And so I think that having those images of cells and being able to watch these processes happen in real time made the science real to me in another way, in addition to just, you know, getting the output of numbers. Um, so that was probably number two. I'd have to think hard to come up with another number three on my feet, but <laughs> I'll while you're this. while you're thinking, um, you know, you mentioned microscopy, and that's to me that has always been of interest, but never had the opportunity or the chance, or maybe didn't have the the stamina to go through and learn how to do microscopy. And the number of times I, I've worked with cells and, and looked at cells internalizing, I always thought to myself, my God, this is such an art. Mm -hmm. You know, um, no wonder there's this contest of like best microscopy images and things like that. And we've come such a long way to now be able to look at live cells over time. Mm -hmm. And then you can see the, the events happening and, Yes, the output from a plate reader is meh compared to that, mm -hmm. but the, being able to see it is just amazing. I certainly agree. Um, I think that, you know, if I were to pick a third, it would be several occurrences of not, I guess it's not really a specific time, but several occurrences in which my research failed for a while and then all of a sudden started working after, you know, changing 18 variables. And so this has cropped up in my scientific career, both in cloning, as well as in all sorts of other assays. Um, and I think that those are the most rewarding experiences when something's not working, and then you go through every single possible thing that you could change in order to get your experiment to finally work. Um, and, you know, work, whatever that means, based upon, you know, not necessarily just not working in that it's not proving your hypothesis, but that the actual experiment is yeah. not working. Yeah. Um, and so I think that those times of resilience that ultimately, and sometimes they don't, but when they do um, ultimately lead to success are few and far between sometimes, but when they do happen are very rewarding. Yeah. It's the, uh, dopamine rush I'm gonna have to coin this term and have it put on a mug or something because I feel like we're we're going from dopamine rush to dopamine rush and in between you have this desert of okay. stuff not working but then it's it's it tests you it's like the GPCR or the GRK is testing you um, and so that you can go through all that optimization and make sure that you know all the controls are in place everything is reproducible and whatever the data the data is the data i mean if it if if it disproves your hypothesis then so be it that's great to know as well but the satisfaction from running an experiment with the all the right controls all the right conditions and seeing that the experiment is beautifully set up and it's running well i mean it's it's just wow definitely i completely agree i think that that mug would certainly work and would be 
quite appropriate in the GPCR field. Yeah, I think we need to think about it because we have we have this one and we have uh, different variations of this one. But we were thinking of putting together a project. I think we even started it where we would um, collect quotes, like lab specific quotes, mm-hmm. and then and then print them print them on the mugs. It's kind of a project we kind of set aside. But I think the it would make a lot of sense to <laughs> to have these. Definitely. All right, Julia, thank you so much for your time. I uh, for having me. I had a blast, and again, welcome to the team. Thank you. I'm very excited for our work moving forward, and loved being here today. So, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. We're gonna stop recording and don't go anywhere. But uh, and then we're gonna let people wonder what are we talking about after we stop recording. <laughs> Amazing. Sounds great. Thank you for joining us for this, for this Doctor GPCR podcast episode. We would like to take a moment and thank our guests as well as our Dr. GPCR team members, Attila, Ines, Montserrat, Ivana, Andrina, Balint, and Julia. A huge thank you to our ecosystem partners for their support, Domain Therapeutics, GPCR Therapeutics, Design Pharmaceuticals, Montana Molecular, and Orion Biotechnology. You can connect with our partners directly in the ecosystem. Join us today. Please also don't forget to subscribe to the Dr. GPCR monthly newsletter. Find us on YouTube, and if you like our podcast, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcast. You can also leave us a testimonial on our website. Another way to support us is to share your favorite Dr. GPCR program with your network and colleagues. You can always email us with any questions or suggestions at hello at drgpcr.com. And until next time, stay safe.